This presentation is based on our recently released best-selling book, The Employee Experience, How to Attract Talent, Retain Top Performers, and Drive Results. My name is Charles Rogel, and I'm the Vice President of Products and Marketing for DecisionWise. I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Our presenters are the authors of the book, Dr. Tracy Millett and Matt Ride. Hi, it's good to be here. Good morning. Tracy is the CEO of DecisionWise and holds a doctorate degree in organization change. He's also the co-author of our previous book, Magic, Five Keys to Unlock the Power of Employee Engagement. Matt is the Chief Operating Officer at DecisionWise, and he holds a JD degree. He oversees our company's operations, as well as its finance, legal, and administrative functions. DecisionWise has been in business since 1996. We specialize in conducting employee engagement surveys and measuring and improving the employee experience within organizations. Our presentation is based on uh, the book, like I mentioned before, um, it's our second book, and it's be recently been, um, we released it on January 30th, and since then it's hit uh, numerous bestseller lists. On Amazon, um, it's been number one in uh, as a new release for three weeks in uh, these three categories here. In fact, it's been a hot new release, I not just, love the way not they just a that. new release. So I'm not sure what const constitutes hot, but I've seen that pop up on the screen a few times as we've been monitoring uh, sales. And also on Barnes & Noble, it was recognized um, the, the first week it came out as a business uh, book bestseller, number one on the business book bestseller list, and number 11 overall of their 100 best books. Um, so there's been a lot of great momentum around the sale of the book uh, during these next few weeks. That's what we're going to talk about is the message from the book and, uh, and what it really means to um, uh, leaders in business as well as um, HR uh, professionals. We, we were excited about seeing this because what it tells us really is that we you get the right topic. Um, we got excited when we were writing this. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is. One of the reasons why I think it has so much appeal is because people are starting to realize that, yeah, this really is what it's all about. Um, not just human resources, but also change and then also the organizational structure. So not only are HR professionals understanding this, but it's kind of in general leaders are starting to understand it really is about the employee experience, which, which is what we'll address today. So a couple, um, a couple notes here. One, this webcast is scheduled for 60 minutes. Everyone's going to be on mute. If you have questions, please use the question tool to submit them, and we will respond to them as we go throughout our presentation. Um, this uh, presentation has also been approved for one hour of HR general recertification credit through HRCI and also uh, credit through SHRM. So after the presentation, I will show you those or provide you those uh, activity IDs, and I'll send you an email with those codes so you can redeem your free credit along with um, links to some other materials from today's presentation. So let's begin by talking about a statistic that I didn't really believe at first when I saw it, and that is in the last 15 years, 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. And I was curious to kind of get your perspective on this. You know, I realize there's a lot of um, commotion in the marketplace. A lot of times companies um, uh, are being merged or being bought, and and there's you know Wall Street is encouraging profits at a record pace, and so there's a lot of volatility going on. Um, but 15 years, 52 percent of the companies have disappeared. Well, you know, some of it, in fairness, is due to like you said, acquisitions or mergers. Yeah. So some of them didn't fail; they were acquired. But I think this is Matt Wright speaking. I think that what this um, statistic tells us is it confirms that the market is changing from uh, a manufacturing products oriented uh, space to where the knowledge worker, as Peter Drucker calls it, is preeminent. And so there are a lot of winners and losers in there and they can rise fast and they can fall fast, but we're dealing with a different type of worker and we're dealing with a need to manage that worker differently. We're trying to pull out human creativity out of folks, and that is different, and I think that's one of the reasons for the volatility. Well, I agree. You know, um, Matt, Char you know this, but Charles and I met each other as we were going through an MBA program a number of years ago. I'm not going to say how many years ago, but <laughs> a number of years ago. And one of the books, this, this may date it a bit, one of the books that we were required to read was Collins and Force's Built to Last. Great, great book. Still a classic today. But as you look at those organizations, a good portion of those organizations don't exist today. Not only do they not exist, but even if they do exist, they exist in a different form than they had in the past. So even those organizations that have st st stayed, 
that 52%, the other 48% that's still still around, they have a different form than they had in the past. And like you say, it's less based on maybe the manufacturing lines or the technology than it is on the people. Well, IBM is a good example, right? IBM is, has changed from a production company building mainframes, sure. personal computers, and hardware to very much a services company in light of the fact that we're in a services economy. Yeah. You know, and I think this is part of the reason why I'm going to refer back to the book here. I think this is part of the reason why why it, it's done so well over the last little bit is because folks are realizing that this is not about, business is no longer about assembly lines. It really is about their their greatest expense. You know, you and I talk about this all the time, Matt, that the idea that we need to understand that our greatest expense is our people, and we need to be able to get uh, a return on that investment. Right. Right. So along those same lines, I mean, it, it's obvious that the business world has changed, not only from it becoming more of a um, information-based economy or service-based economy, but from this fact that people are recognizing that people really drive results within the company. We do, when we do workshops along these lines or keynotes, one of the things that we do is we, we do an online survey, so they hop on using, using one of our tools. And we ask them the question, what are the greatest people challenges you're facing today? So these may be HR audiences or they may be general leadership audiences. Mm -hmm. They still come up with the same thing and it really is how do we how do we attract the right talent? How do we retain that talent? Um, and how do we engage them to drive results? There's been this movement over the last little while and, and you know we this is our second book on employee engagement. The idea that employees need to be engaged. Now we're starting to see a, a shift also in terms of how do we keep our employees happy? Mm -hmm. Well what, what people are telling us through this, through these surveys and some things that we ask about is, it's not about having engaged or happy employees. It's about, do we have people who can drive results within our company? So businesses are now focused a lot more on how do we attract talent, retain talent, but engage talent that will give those results. I think that for the business leader poses a unique challenge that they didn't have to worry about before. And that is, is in our book we, we make the statement your, one of your most important jobs as a leader is to give people reason to join your cause, mm -hmm. even if you're at a, at a line level, to stay, give them a reason to stay, and give them a reason to engage, right? That attract, retain, and engage. You're responsible for creating an employee experience that meets those needs. Um, you, you don't just focus on process or improvement or those things. You, you have to become a people expert or else you're not going to draw value, as Tracy said, from the largest expense item on your P&L. Sure. So getting back kind of the book and the title of the book, um, why, why the book? I guess you know, we've, we've done a lot of research on employee engagement before we got the, our, our book on employee engagement. That seems to have been the main focus for a number of the past years for organizations and their workforce. People have been kind of tuned into this topic, it seems. So the employee experience, is that just kind of pivoting off of engagement, or is it a different construct altogether? Well, you know, first of all, we didn't start out to write a book, and I think that's important to understand. What we really set out to do was understand how organization could compete in this new world, mm -hmm. in these changes. What, what creates that stability within an organization while still creating innovation? How do we keep these people? How do we retain them? And uh, we went back through our survey database, so we, had to, we looked through about 24 million survey responses across well, more than 70 countries in over 30 languages. Uh, it's the largest database of its kind to understand what is it that's really causing people to, to stay and engage in the things they did. It kept re coming back to this concept of engagement, engagement being more than just I show up for work. It's I, I actually bring my best self to work. So our findings were really the basis for this book. The employee experience, uh, as we mentioned, was released back uh, just a few weeks ago. And one of the things that we found very, very clearly is it, 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 it all, all of this refers back to how do we make sure that people are delivering business results. So Charles, a uh, long answer to your question, but yes, it is about engagement. Mm -hmm. But why do we care about engagement? Well, it's because it drives business results. It, it drives the success of that organization. Employee engagement is an emotional state of your employees when they're giving their very best to the work. And that was our first book, Magic, right? But the EX is the framework that allows for that type of scenario to take place. It's not haphazard, yeah. right? That's, I think, the premise. And the other reason we chose the title was to combat and maybe kind of 
in a good way, poke people in the eye and say, you focus on the customer experience so much, what we really need you to do is take a step back and focus on your employee experience. Not only will that create an engaged workforce, but that engaged workforce will do more for your, your customer experience than anything else you sure. can do. So, so we're going to go through the, um, the three uh, contracts that we talked about before, attracting, retaining, and then engaging uh, your workforce. So. Talking about um, this approach, attracting your best talent. There's a lot of competition now. The economy is heating up. Employment seems to be getting better. Um, and this is starting to be more of a challenge for HR professionals, especially, to really get the right people in the seats. Charles, let me lay the groundwork, and then Tracy can lead out. But when we use the term contract, it's a construct or a, or a way of thinking of how to align expectations. So when we talk about what is our contract with a particular group, a particular individual, we're talking about all of those sets of expectations that they have and that we have that form the basis of that relationship. So we chose to call it a contract. Okay. So when we use that term, that's what we're talking about. And so the first contract is what is it that we do? What do we have out there that's going to get people in the door? The attracting the best talent then is it's truly about the best talent. So we, along with Matt, what Matt was just saying, in, in some of these workshops that we've been, we've you know, been asked to speak at a few different places here regarding this piece, but we asked the question, how many of you would say you are currently having difficulty in attracting talent that fits with your organization? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. We know what the answer is going to be, but what tends to be the aha is they, they sit in that room and they look at all the other hands that are going up. By the way, it's, you know, it's most every hand in the room. Right. And they look at that and say, well, I thought this was maybe just a challenge with us. And then, of course, it, it isn't. It, it spreads all through. In fact, look, I'll show you this graph here. Pull this one up. They're realizing they're competing with each other, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have 300 people in that room, and you have 299 that are competing against you for that talent. And it's not just talent in your industry. It's talent across to find the right people. Yeah. What we're looking at, this is pulled from the Bureau of, of Labor Statistics. So this is not just a number we came up with. And it's not just a, a graph that doesn't represent anything just for the sake of having a graph. <laughs> Basically, what we're looking at here is something that's happened for the first time in over 40 years. Very, very interesting. And even back when it happened before, it had a, little, a lot different twist. So if you look at the white line there, the white line is the, the number of hires. You also look at the yellow line or the greenish line, and that's a job openings, and then you have the number of quits. That is actually the term that's used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics is quits. Quits represents those that number of people who intentionally leave the organization. So it wasn't because of layoffs, not because of intentional termination, but these are individuals who choose to leave the organization. Now notice what happened during the recession, recession back in 2008, 2009 in the United States. This was also on both sides of that 2008, 2009, we see it throughout the world as well. The number of hires goes down. It makes sense. We simply don't have enough, uh, we, we don't have open positions. The number of job openings went way down, and the number of people that quit went way down as well. What was interesting during this time is, as we followed engagement, engagement also tanked during this period of time. So we had a lot of people who were disengaged in their jobs, yet they chose to remain. It was kind of a <laughs> quit and stay. Right. They, they kind of retired and forgot to tell anybody that they were leaving the organization. But they were actually physically there. Now, what we're seeing now is something that's changed. Started in 2016 and become even more pronounced in 2017, and that is the number of job openings exceeds the number of hires and the number of quits. All right, by your quits by a long shot. We actually have more people quitting their jobs now than we did before because they have options. Yeah. They can go to other places. So what this means is that for the first time in decades, job openings have surpassed the number of hires. So when we ask the question, what does this mean to the organization today? What does it mean to, to HR? Um, they basically, the, one of the first things that come up is, is stress. Of course, everybody laughs about that one. So um, the idea here is that basically what we've done is created an environment where the employees have options they didn't have in the past, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, you basically can't keep up with the number of positions you're trying to fill. Right. So we've addressed the attracting talent, but you know, it's just not about just attracting talent. We have a number of folks who are leaving the organizations as well. So our second challenge is really how do we retain those top performers? Because yeah, you look at that chart and you think, okay, not only am I trying to poach people from other organizations, 
I'm getting poached too. You've got to keep the, the intellectual capital that I have in the organization. Now remember that a cost to replace a, a $40,000 manager, for example, can be estimated as much as 8000 and as much as five times the salary. So these numbers um, vary all over the place. But let's suppose that the best case scenario is 20% of that person's salary. It can be as high as three times that amount. Think of how much it costs to retain that person and, and hire that person. We worked with a number of large organizations, and one of those um, had nearly 50% annual attrition. So statistically speaking, this meant that they would lose about half their workforce or 10,000 employees every year. Hmm. That's a lot. So you start adding this multiplier on there and realizing how much it counts. So they asked us to come in and follow up with 4,500 of these employees. Uh, this was across 29 countries. And they asked us, how do we reduce this number by even 5%? Can you imagine the amount of savings by 5%? What we found pretty clearly is that employees were leaving at about the eight or nine month mark, and there were reasons for this. And as we addressed those reasons of why they were leaving, which were very, very evident as we started doing uh, surveys and started doing focus groups, they actually reduced that by 10%. You can imagine the amount of savings just by retaining their top performers, but it wasn't all simply that dollar amount in, in not hiring new people. Can you imagine the amount of intellectual capital or institutional knowledge that would have walked out with that 10%? Yeah, I mean, you look at your workers, when they're hitting that nine-month mark, that's when they're starting to become the most productive and, and, and often running, as opposed to still learning. Which, incidentally, is exactly the reason they were leaving. They hit that honeymoon period and weren't growing any longer. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but this is a real business cost. You know, we were just visiting with an HR director of a, of a Silicon Valley startup, and aside from just internal issues, as you noted in your case study, the environment there is that they're just it's a swirling pool of people going and lasting for 18 months and then going to the next sure. startup and lasting 18 months. I mean, it's difficult to get anything done because people are just hopping from the next big startup to the next big startup. So it can be internal and it can just be uh, you know external factors. Let's, let's talk a little bit about why this exists. So this is a variation of that last graph. This is another Bureau of Labor Statistics graph. And notice what's happened for the first time in a long time. Uh, and by a long time, I mean in about the last 10 years or so, we're seeing this reversal happen again. So what we're seeing is that the number of people that are quitting the organization exceeds the number of people who are laid off or discharged. So back in the recession, we saw that, that inverse proportion. It's now coming back to basically where employees, if they choose to leave an organization, can leave an organization. In fact, according to the, again, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that uh, we are at full employment in the United States. Basically, technically, what this means is that everybody that wants a job can find a job. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously know that that may take time, and we obviously know it may not be the ideal job, but it means that I can leave a job, and and it's changed. So, Matt, I love, we, we've used this term quite a bit, the age of the employee. Uh, as you think about your relationship vis-a-vis -vis your talent and your workforce, it used to be that the organization was in the position of power. And that has slowly, through technological advancements and changes in the, the economy, to where we're now seeing the balance of power has shifted in favor of the employee. Mm -hmm. They can leave, they can work. Uh, you know, if I were working in manufacturing in the 60s, and I I wasn't terribly mobile, and there may have been three places I could go. I was going to stay with that employer, and I was going to stay a long time. Now I can continue working in Montana, and I can work for five different startups over a 10-year period, and I can stay in Montana. So this is the age of the employee, and so we have to respond to that and understand that the power dynamic has shifted. This was really our first big finding as we went through this book. It, it makes sense intuitively, but very, very clearly, we've entered a new age we talk about the industrial age. We've entered the age of the employee where the employees do have power. The power is shifted to those employees. And we haven't really touched on millennials here either. I know that's a big, a big topic, but the, the mobility of the younger workforce uh, also makes it more difficult to retain uh, your talent. Yeah, you know, the, the millennials, I don't know that they're any different than, than we were, right? I mean, here at DecisionWise, we're kind of we may be carrying the banner in favor of the millennials. What is different, though, is that there are young, um, a young group with ideals like we had, with more options. 
Well, and, and that's changing yeah. the dynamic. It's not so much that they're different than we were, or maybe they we, we value the same things we did when we were 20, but they have access to resources in a way we didn't have. That's exactly it. The choices are theirs now, where yeah. perhaps when we would have fit into that 20 to 30-year category, uh, we didn't have those options. Right. Yeah. And there's a ton more. They're making up a larger portion of the workforce, and they're naturally more mobile anyway. Younger workers are. Yeah. So they yeah. tend to jump along. Well, you know, there's a Harvard study that was done along these lines also. Harvard found that when layoffs occurred or uh, discharges were done, the number of people that actually left the organization was five times the number of people that were expected through those layoffs. Hmm. Now that's, um, and that's just been over the last little while. That wasn't the case in the past. If, if you know, 20, 30 years ago, or even during the recession, laid off 10% of the population, the rest of the population was looking around and saying, uh, okay, I better keep my job for now until things get better and then I can jump. Well, right now, if that were to happen, people would, would question that. If, you know, the survivor syndrome, they would say, okay, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Drive results. I think this is where your employee experience has to be on top of its game. And the reason is this. Let me give you a, a real-world case study. We all know there's a need due to climate change to come off of fossil fuel and to make better use, for example, of the grid, of the electric grid, right? Mm -hmm. And so those companies, it's pretty clear, as you read about and study it, that the companies that are going to win are the ones that are going to figure out how to make batteries better, longer, charge faster, all those things. That's what we need in order for Tesla for energy. to really take off, right? Well, the, the secret to that battery doesn't lie in a process and it doesn't lie in a manufacturing. It lies in somebody's head. And so if you're going to win that game, the person that's going to win it is the person that has the talent to solve that problem. And so that's why you're driving business results through people. That's why your EX has to be uh, organized in such a way that, that you're keeping those that are going to make a difference. And that's what everybody's looking for is the next person to discover, you know, the next advancement yeah, batteries, for example. Because if you're just retaining the okay employees or even the bad employees, your retention numbers might go up, but your performance doesn't increase. Yeah. So your EX has to consider the third variable, which is you got to, you've got to solve business problems. You got to win. Yeah, you brought up the term EX. We're going to use that throughout this this webinar. The, the idea comes from uh, obviously employee experience, and we we took this term because the, the term CX is being used so often right now. What is the customer experience? So as we go through here, we're going to be talking about those in that EX. What does that look like and how it, how it impacts the organization? Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is not just, this is not just about making employees happy, right? So there, there's a movement there. This is about how does that organization drive business results mm -hmm. or organizational results to accomplish its mission? Yeah, it used to be the managers and leaders were concerned about managing processes and business outcomes that, that were related to sort of manufacturing or something like that. Yeah. Business leaders now are concerned with how do they uh, manage people? How do they get the most out of these creative talent? That's a different management uh, tool set that's needed than, than what most people have been given. And so that's what we're trying to help people understand is you gotta, you got to add some more things to your toolbox. When we talk about driving results, uh, that's where employee engagement comes into play. Mm -hmm. Now, employee engagement isn't, there are organizations today that are spending um, obscene amounts of money on perks. Yeah. Right? They're perking their way to engage in their so they think. Um, and it's funny, as we do some of these workshops, we'll ask the question, what are some of the things that you've seen? All the way from map pods to, uh, you know, it's interesting, some organizations now we saw a push about uh, six months ago for even uh, egg fertilization for the female workers in order to make sure that we had the right employees here that would that would sacrifice career for a bit of time. Oh, preserving in, preserving, preserving yeah. eggs, yeah. Yeah, uh, human eggs. Um, so there are all kinds of bonuses and perks and things that exist about there. And it's not that we're against perks, but you can't perk your way to, to uh, employee engagement. Do perks attract people? Sure they do. Um, we talk about some of the perks in the book. Do perks motivate? Possibly, but those motivations are very temporary. Engagement is different. Engagement is really when we when we capture that, it, as Matt mentioned, it's an emotional state, and we capture that passion, that energy, and that commitment to the work. So in turn, what happens is not only are they engaged, but they're also investing their best selves, 
their hearts, spirits, minds, and hands in the work that they do. The key point I'd like to drive home is that just doesn't happen. That yeah. the, the employee experience is, the, is taking design thinking and saying, we need to build a, a, a framework and a culture that will support engagement. It just doesn't happen on its own, and it's not just something you luck into. We need you to take serious steps towards designing an experience that promotes this state, because when people are operating here, you're getting their very best. That's really the second big point that we found in this book, and that is that those organizations who are doing it right make it intentional. Right? And so you use the term design thinking. We have an entire uh, section on that. They intentionally design their employee experience to create engagement. Otherwise, employee experience will always happen. It's like culture. Culture is there. Good or bad, culture is there. Um, the employee experience has to be intentionally designed to create a positive employee experience. Now we talk about the hands, the heart, etc. So look at the heart and the spirit. So we're looking, we're looking across here vertically. Heart and the spirit represent that internal feeling. So this is a feel. But we also want the, the lateral pieces, the horizontal pieces, the mind and the hands. Those, those represent the do. The heart being the, the uh, love for the job. I love what I'm doing. The spirit being that passion, that fire that's burning within. Those are important. We want them to feel that. But they represent feeling. We also want doing. And this book is also about how do we create that doing piece, the mind and the hands that are involved in there as well. By the way, that's, that's a, the topic of our book, Magic, as well, talking a lot more about that. So let's get into the, the actual idea of the employee experience. So we've talked, we've talked a couple of points that were very important to us as we went through here. What we found is that that employee experience has to be intentionally designed. Yeah, let me, let me what I'll do is tell you what a employee experience is not. And it's not just your employee life cycle. Those that operate in the HR world think of, want to think that employee experience means, you know, my, the first impression that they receive and then their experience during the recruiting process and their onboarding and then their first performance review. And you kind of have this chronological um, specified event. Yeah, yeah, specified, specified events. Event. That's not what we mean by the employee experience. It's part of it. But it's it's much broader than that, and so I think it, it really is. And Tracy, do you have the, the our, our we spent hours trying to figure out the precise definition, but the sum of perceptions is really what it really the is. employee experience is. So yes, the sum of perceptions about the about the uh, events that that happen, but also um, remember the the key word here being perceptions. Yeah, the idea that it may or may not be. So two people may have the exact same employee life cycle. All right, so we use the example of uh, Ingvar and Edvar in, in this. Two folks that two two gentlemen who join at the same time. They have the same boss. They're paid the same salary. Have the same role. Go through the same employee life cycle basically, but they have different employee experiences. And the reason that is is because they have different perceptions of what's going on. For one of these gentlemen, Ingvar, for example, he has a, a couple of children, and so he likes the idea of being able to go getting off at three in the afternoon and spending time with soccer with them going out to the ball games. Whereas Edvar, on the other hand, he we use the example, he plays uh, what was a guitar in a band at night, and so mm -hmm. he gets in at 2 in the morning, and his head may not be clear. So he likes the, the flexibility of being able to come in at 10 o'clock. Well, for one, this employee experience may be wonderful. For the other person, it may be uh, completely opposite of that. And the idea here is that if we were looking at the employee life cycle, it's perfectly uh, legitimate to have uh, or, or reasonable to have equal employee life cycles. They could have the exact same thing, but their experience may be different based on perception. Right. Let's use an example. I think I love this. Wells Fargo. Uh, a while back, uh, several months ago, Wells Fargo was caught into a scandal where they had pretty aggressive sales strategies, um, and so people would were kind of gaming the system in order to meet their sales quotas. You know, this, this happened, first of all, back in August of 2016. And um, Wells Fargo was, well, in, in August of 2016 is when they were actually fined. So $185 million, I think it was, with potentially a lot more to come. I was reading headlines yesterday that said they uh, terminated another five senior execs because of this. And what was interesting is the CEO, John Strumpf, took, I'm putting these in air quotes here, ownership. By, and he said, by significantly strengthening training programs, reviewing accounts, eliminating the sales goals, things like this. Oh, and by the way, 
taking ownership meant they fired 5,300 employees right off the bat. So here we go. They said, let's fire all of those bad employees that caused the problem. But the reality was the problem wasn't these horrible employees. What the bank forgot is that we are in the age of the employee. The problem was the bank had encouraged this incentive plan. In some cases, it was forced. They encouraged the employees to open multiple fraudulent accounts and to meet sales targets. You know, one of the scenarios was if you didn't meet your account, you had to work weekends. Hmm. And then you wonder why people are going to fudge on their numbers. Right. Right. So if you're creating, we, we joked that it was a version of corporate hunger games. If that's what, <laughs> if that's what exists, you, you leaders are responsible for exactly what you got. Well, the, the CEO stands up and claims that, that it was only the underperforming employees that they felt needed to go, 5,300 of them. So employees meet bus, right? Yeah. Let's look at the chain of events. Bank sets sales quotas. Employees can't meet those quotas. Employees create bogus accounts. And then the end result is that the customer suffers. So what we have here is an employee experience that resulted in uh, a customer experience. Let me just give you a quick neighborhood example. So a number of months ago, I went into this bakery, and I love the love this bakery, and I went in for my, my apple fritter, and I get there, and I look in the back of the room, and there wasn't an attendant there at the counter. She was back in the back, and I hear her boss yelling at her. Now, this was probably a 16, 17-year-old girl, and the boss is back there yelling at that individual, and she comes up to the front. She sees there, and the boss says, go out and help these people. And I could hear this going on in the back, and she comes out and said, what do you want? Or what, what do you need is what she said. What do you need? She didn't say, hey, can I help you, welcome, et cetera. And I, I looked at her and thought, well, I, I just want to turn around and leave. And then I realized, here we have a 16 or 17-year-old girl, probably innocent of anything that was going on back there, rather than the fact that the manager thought he needed to exercise some authority. And he, he's yelling at her. My customer experience was a direct result of her employee experience. So another point that we learned in this book that we write about is that the customer experience is downstream from the employee experience. Before we leave this slide, that that was an actual business owner who paid to have that banner printed and put up on his shop. So <laughs> that's not a very good customer experience when when he's willing to fork out three or four hundred dollars to the local <laughs> print shop to create that banner <laughs> and then find a ladder to put that on the side of his building. Now is, is Wells Fargo doing things to try to recover from this? They're a good organization and and, and they will. They will recover from this, and they're doing some things to make that happen. Um, in a lot of people's minds, it's not enough, and it's too late, too late to do that. But what it does teach us is something, and that is these organizations are focusing so much on the customer experience that they're, this phrase that we use, they're digging in the wrong place. So, Matt, we started off the book actually with a... Yeah, kind of a some folklore here, right? This is a reference to a movie that both you and I love, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, and in it, Indiana Jones is looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and to find it, he needs to go to a map room, which is a miniature model of the city. To know the location, you have to put um, this crystal on top of a staff known as the Staff of Ra and you need to shine it in the light and then it will it will cause a beam of light to appear and illuminate the location where the Ark of the Covenant. And there's this headpiece that has the crystal and has markings on it and um, the Nazis have half the markings and Indiana and his, his uh, Sala, his compatriot, have the full markings and they realize after talking to this guy who's interpreting the markings for him that the Nazis don't have the right length of the staff, and they in unison say they're digging in the wrong place. Yeah. Right? They clap, they start hugging each other and dancing anyway. So the point is, is we 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 felt that kind of rang true as we thought about our research here. Uh, companies are digging in the wrong place. We just couldn't get that out of our heads. They're spending so much time measuring and obsessing over the customer experience that they're forgetting the really the engine that really drives. Um, success, which is their people. Let me give you some numbers that we found in the book. So this came, a 2014 report estimates that the market for customer experience management services, so this could be surveying the customer and technology, et cetera, behind that. So that market will grow in 2014 from $3.77 to $10.77 in 2020. 
So we're spending a lot of money measuring customer experience, trying to improve that customer experience. And what we're saying is exactly what Indy said here. They're digging in the wrong place. Great, we need to be focusing on that customer. But the customer experience is a result of the employee experience, as Wells Fargo is finding out. It's kind of a self-evident quote. And it's been our main point that we've been talking about through this entire uh, webinar. But this next slide, I think, is really powerful. And this is from um, Dr. Stephen Covey. He says, always treat your employees exactly as you want them to treat your best customers. Um, I don't know how to say it any better than uh, <laughs> I nailed it. And this is one of those that Wells Fargo's finding out now. Um, Volkswagen's finding this out, you know, the idea that we created an experience where it's okay to fudge on, on emission systems. Now the customer is experiencing that. And we're, we're trying to create a delightful customer experience when the employees are being shown something different, shown something different. So here's, here's a central theme that comes up all the way through this book. EX equals CX. So the customer experience is a direct result of my amazing employee experience. And if we can create a deliberate employee experience. By the way, we call this in the book, this is the law of congruent experience. Law of congruent experience. It says employees will deliver a customer experience that matches their own employee experience. So here's where we define the employee experience. The employee experience is the sum of perceptions employees have about their interactions with the organization in which they work. Now sum of perceptions. It's perfectly possible that I may have a negative experience but I'm going to look at the sum of all those perceptions to define my employee experience. So this book is really about how do we create a great employee experience. And in our research, we found that it boils down to two areas. First of all, the, what we refer to as expectation alignment. We'll go into detail on that one. So first one is expectation alignment. The second one is what we refer to as the contract. We actually broke this down into three different, three different contracts. But the degree to which those contracts are in place and honored really uh, create this, the degree of uh, employee experience. In fact, Matt, when we were writing this book, we originally were going to name this the contract. Yeah. We realized it sounded like a cool John Grisham model. <laughs> right. Yeah, Wiley, our publisher, didn't want that. <laughs> I wanted to touch on the, the word sum there, Tracy, and, and give an example. Let's say you have an employee who joins, and she's disheartened by the fact that she discovers there's there's a pay pay gap or an inequality between what women and men are paid. Okay, so that's that's a negative that's a withdrawal from her EX bank account. But let's say that a, a month later she is invited to participate in an, in a commission or in a group a committee to solve that problem. Well, now now the company kind of makes up for it. So companies. There's debits and credits that happen all along, and the idea is to be on the winning side of the ledger. And that's why we wanted to purposely say it's the sum of perceptions. It's not just a static type of concept. Yes, exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about expectation alignment. Now, I'll give you some studies that were done. The first study was done by the National Institute of Mental Health. So this is one of the studies that we write about in this book. They looked at 82 couples within their first few months of marriage. These are married couples, first newlyweds, 82 of these. What they did was they videotaped these pairs as they discussed difficult problems confronting their marriages. So they did a series of these videotapes, and they followed these folks. They conducted eight tests over a six-month interview uh, intervals, and they also um, videotaped these. So they were examining a few things. They examined their general relationship skills. They did also, they looked at some preconceived expectations for marriage, uh, happiness, etc. Uh, and about how the spouse behaved. Do you have high expectations of your spouse, high expectations of your, your marital happiness, or low expectations? And they did some, some interesting correlations between these two. At the end of their study, there were 17 of these couples that were divorced. So of the remaining 65, those who had, now follow me on this one because it takes some, some logic here, those who had high expectations for happiness, but poor relationship skills, they experienced very sharp declines in the marriage over the first four years. No brainer, right? High expectations for happiness, poor relationship skills, that marriage was going to tank. Now here's what's interesting. Those with low expectations of happiness and low expectations of their spouse um, didn't show that same level of decline in satisfaction. 
regardless of their relationship skills. So even though they may not communicate very well, even though they may not have had the finances, if you had low expectations of that spouse, meaning you didn't think that this individual is going to do X, X, and X, and uh, squeeze the toothpaste right, that kind of thing, they didn't experience those declines in satisfaction. So the research clearly found that the same thing happened to employees. Um, I guess one of the things we ask in the book, is this simply meaning that we need to set low expectations of our spouse? No, not by any stretch. In fact, we write just the opposite of that. But the idea is our satisfaction, our happiness, and our engagement in a relationship is much more dependent, dependent on whether expectations are met than it is the external circumstances of that relationship. Right. I mean, you could have a marriage where there were, you know, monthly trips to the Bahamas and all the toys you want, but if, if expectations aren't being met, those uh, perks, yeah, they don't solve the problem. And you can have a, a relationship where they live very modestly, but if their expectations are aligned, they can have a very fruitful and strong relationship. You got it. I'll read a quote from the book. Um, by the way, this chapter is titled, or this section is titled, Dear, Did You Forget to Take Out the Trash Again? Um, should we lower our expectations for our spouses and forget about developing any relationship skills? Not quite. However, according to our research, our level of satisfaction depends less on the external conditions of the marriage than it does on whether expectations are met. As they state in their findings, and this is a quote, satisfaction goes down when a spouse's expectations don't fit with reality. Then most couples could have told you that. Uh, the, the findings are astonishing. Basically, satisfaction within a relationship has less to do with external conditions such as money, leisure time, or compatibility than whether their expectations, big or small, are met. So if you apply this to the business world, and you can see good examples of this. We write about Amazon as a case study and Goldman Sachs. The conditions sometimes for new workers, you know, new, new analysts or new, new investment bankers at Goldman Sachs are brutal but they know exactly what they're, they're getting into, and therefore they don't complain because there's a fair trade or an exchange, and there's alignment. They know what to expect. What's really problematic is when you start somewhere and you think you're going to have a 45-hour work week and you end up working 70-hour work, work weeks for the next six months. That's when you're going to have a problem. Sure. This is the reason why uh, organizations can send healthcare professionals into, into poorest of countries in India or Africa, and they work in difficult situations, live in difficult situations, yet they're willing to do this because that's what they expect. Yet, if the um, if the heat in a building of employees is two degrees lower than it should be, <laughs> right. then all of a sudden, you know, you have a massive rebellion on your hands because those expectations are not aligned. Let's get into the next piece. So, there's the third piece that you, we. We, we understood as we were writing this book, it's less about external conditions, more about whether expectations are aligned. We call this the contract, contract with a big C, because it represents three subcontracts. Um, when we align expectations around these contracts, then the, we, we created a delightful employee experience. The contracts are the brand contract, the transactional contract, and the psychological contract. And we spent about half the book talking about how to align these contracts and what they are. It's important to understand that every relationship has a contract, whether that's spouses, whether it's boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, boss, subordinate, father, son, um, organization, employee. Every relationship has a contract, whether we see it or not. So part of what we need to do is be aware of these contracts. The quality of the relationship will depend on how well the contract is honored. And you honor the contract by aligning expectations and then keeping those aligned throughout the process. The brand contract is the first, and this is the one that is designed to meet your needs related to attraction. How do you attract the right employees? It's aligning what you need from the workforce with what you tell the outside world. And so some companies are really good at this, and others uh, don't do a good job at all. And so. One of the things that we recommend companies do is assess and take the time through surveys and assessments, measure what, what it is that why employees came to them in the first place, what keeps them there, and this will help them use some data to, to better establish their brand contract rather than just sort of guessing and saying, we want to be a cool company. Well, that doesn't work. You know, 
an example of that is Zenefits. Zenefits is an HIRS startup. It's a media darling out of San Francisco. And it, it was its original brand contract was that it was a kind of a free willing uh, startup. But the reality is, is that they're insurance brokers and they need to be very careful and compliance oriented. They've had to change their contract with their employees and with their customers to kind of acknowledge that they're a serious minded organization. And that's an example of where you can inadvertently create, think that you can just do this without really assessing its impact on your employee experience and on your business outcomes. Well, it seems like this is at risk a lot, especially with the difficulty to attract talent now with the, with the way the, the hiring environment is, that HR managers are willing to do or say, or recruiters are willing to do or say almost anything to get good applicants in the door. Sure. Um, but then, you know, six months later, they realize this isn't what I and, told. And, you know, Charles, what we really want companies to start doing is to stop saying good applicants or talented applicants and uh -huh. start saying right applicants. Okay. Does the talent we're getting meet our business objectives and meet the um, uh, REX, sure. right? So it's just a little bit of a nuance. But you're right. Most people are just like, oh, you just, just get talent. Just get the best candidates you can. Maybe. Well, the brand contract is one of those that we'll, we'll talk about what this creates in just a second. Uh, Matt, you're exactly, you're right on on here. So the brand is really that public face we display. It's the face that we intentionally or unintentionally put forward. And people make uh, assumptions based on that brand, that this is what I'm going to get. So your brand contract consists of everything that your culture, your reputation, media coverage, uh, behavior of your people, et cetera, does to create that expectation. So I mentioned a little bit earlier a company of 10,000 employees, just as an example, that had nearly 50% attrition. Now I'll tell you why. Through the research that we did to understand what was happening, we realized it was a brand contract issue. So we learned the reason why is that people were joining this company because it was an employer of choice in the area. That's a great thing. They have a great brand. So for the first six months, the company lived up to that reputation with those employees. First six months, I'm being developed. I'm continuing to learn. But about month seven, they stopped learning. They stagnated. And they quit at month seven or eight because the brand that the company put forward, which is a we're innovative company, we'll develop you, we'll help you grow, the public face was put forward was different from what they actually experienced, and expectations were not aligned. So here was an example of the brand contract not being met. What happens when the brand contract's honored? First of all, your brand contract is what helps you attract talent. That's why employees join. When it's honored, employees will remain with the organization. If they're committed, they're engaged, they want to be part of what they do, but they're committed to the organization they chose to join. But the commitment doesn't last forever, and that's the next contract, which is um, the transactional contract. That's how you retain them beyond that honeymoon period. So this is really what does a company owe an employee? Owe an employee? I ask the question as we do these workshops, what do I as an employer owe my employees? And they, they come up with a few different responses, and, and there really aren't that many. You know, once in a while, someone will start throwing out things like, they owe me uh, great benefits. We ask the question, well, do they really owe you that? <laughs> well, not necessarily. Um, there are certain things that are owed, and we need to make sure that that's part of the contract. The transactional contract is the mutually accepted, uh, reciprocal, explicit agreements between two or more entities or parties. They define the basic terms of this relationship. This would include things like pay, hours, working conditions, policies, regulations, uh, procedures. So for example, here's the contract. You work 40 hours and we'll give you a paycheck. Um, very transactional, very quid pro quo. It's this for that. You know, I think one thing that surprised us, Tracy, in, in writing the book and doing the research was how powerful this, this contract sure. is. We were worried that this was going to be viewed as just a throw-in. What we really discovered is just the opposite, that it's a powerful tool for shaping and keeping people there. You're living up to what you promise, and you're clear in how you do that. And the transactional contract is, can be in anything from a policy manual to a, to a work diagram that shows how work happens. You're very clear. You're very uh, open about what you need from your employees, and then you honor what you tell them you're going to give them. And so it can be, uh, it, we call this the undervalued workhorse in um, in companies. People don't spend enough time aligning expectations in this area. You know, Matt, as we were writing this book and 
and folks on this uh, webinar. Matt, Matt's background is legal. He's an attorney. And so as we were writing this, we thought this would be ideal section for Matt. It's, it's about the legalities of working together. What we really realized is the legal portion may be a part of what fits in the transactional contract, but it really really is, what, what is explicit? What are those explicit arrangements that you and I have? So let me give you an example. It's not necessarily a legal example. Let's consider a, a supervisor that isn't getting what he or she expects from an employee. The employee simply isn't delivering. Well, one of the things we find as we conduct exit interviews or, or when we're coaching is sometimes the employee isn't, it's not that they're not capable or don't desire to improve. It's simply because they don't know what's being expected. So part of the transactional contract is make that implicit stuff explicit. Here's what I expect. Here's what we're going to get in return. I'll give you a humorous story that happened here. We had a consultant and an analyst on a call, and the analyst had never been told his expectation. And the, the consultant put the phone on mute and pointed at the analyst and said, this is the part you start talking. Now, ideally, he would have done that before, <laughs> right? Right. But sometimes we have to be pretty direct with people, and that's okay. They appreciate it. It gives them the boundaries and the framework in which they know how to succeed. Now, remember, this doesn't just apply in employee situations. This is any relationship yeah. has a has this contract. When we honor that contract, basically, transactional contract helps us retain those employees. So when we honor the contract, employees stay with us. Yeah. Um, they're satisfied with their jobs. They don't have other reasons to go looking. They, it really is a satisfaction piece. So let's move to the next contract. This one's a little bit, this is a difficult one. And the reason that is is because if we look at an iceberg, and we'll show you this just a minute later, this is, this is what's under the iceberg. This is the stuff that is the, well, let, let's back up a little bit. Every relationship, there are unspoken expectations. All right? Those are things that aren't clearly expressed. They're implied, they're expected, but they're not necessarily explicitly uh, given. So um, some of these may be, for example, in a marriage, some of them may be, I would expect that you would, you would um, honor my career choices. I would expect that you would support me, things like this. And these may not be things that are explicit. In a, in a job relationship, this may be, I, I expect you to devote um, your mind to, to giving us innovation and creativity. Right? This isn't stuff that you put down in an employee employment contract. When we ask people in some of these uh, workshops, we say, describe a good day at work. And what they describe are not things that are part of the explicit contract. These aren't part of the transactional contract. It's the stuff they expect. Well, a good day at work for me is when I feel like I've accomplished something, when I feel like I've contributed, when I feel like I've added value, when I've been given the tools and resources I need to make things happen, uh, when I'm able to get my my list done at the end of the day. These are parts of the transactional contract. And when we honor the transactional contract, there are all kinds of things that are behind that. So you look at the top of the, the transactional contract, it includes things like compensation, benefits, hours worked, etc. But there's this whole layer beneath that iceberg that's the psychological contract. Yeah, an example, I think, is a lot of times we join an organization and we want to contribute, but we also are hopeful that it will be a network building opportunity for me. I'll be better yeah. because I'm part of this organization. I'll get to know interesting people and I'll expand my business network. That's never really laid out, but you have to consider it that it's a fundamental expectation of someone coming to work at your organization. This, this is the area where you need, this is the growth opportunities to really take your EX and make it transformational, is when you start realizing there's these little unknown and unspoken areas, and you start addressing these, now we're starting to get into engaged engagement. Yeah, this is where Charles, as my boss, realizes that in our contract, our transactional contract, he agrees to pay me X amount of money, and I agree to do this in return. But the psychological contract is when we're starting to realize Charles looks through, and we call these the lenses, Charles looks through my lens and is able to see what Tracy really wants in his job is is growing. He wants to learn things. That's not anything we put down in our employment contract, but that's part of the contract that when honored, we're fulfilling those expectations that Tracy has of his job. Charles, I want to grow, by the way. Okay. I'll make an effort on that. When that psychological contract is honored, that's when we engage in what we do. Employees are engaged to drive results when they feel like those terms of the contract are set. 
So we've already retained these folks. We've already brought them on board. This is where we engage people. We um, we use an example um, in the book of of the power of the psychological contract and contract, and we use it based on uh, FDR and the Great Depression. And when he came out with the New Deal, it was about creating a psychological contract with the American people. It it wasn't necessarily a transactional contract. It was we're going to make it. We're going to we're going to do it. And um, that proved to be what was needed in order to help pull the the country out of sort of that cycle of, of depression that we were in, um, and it can it's really powerful. And it's probably the most overlooked aspect of, of managing people and developing them that that we found. And you need to spend time here, and you can do that by by sitting down with your subordinates and talking to them and taking time to assess your relationship with each of them and and actually work on what are these what is the psychological contract and where am I meeting needs and where am I where are my gaps I mean it doesn't have to remain hidden under the iceberg it doesn't you can bring it out and start talking about it and we do that now well we talk about an employee and we say hey look you know what they really are motivated by is X well um, just we, we engaged a vendor uh, not very long ago to, to do certain things and they honored their cycle their transactional contract but what we realized is that we wanted to engage that vendor to do something else. We realize this with our customers as well. Um, our customers often have a psychological contract that we need to surface. Well, the same thing happens with our employees. We've noticed that with the psychological contract, and we, could, we, we have other webinars and pre presentations around this, psychological the contract depends on what we refer to as our magic model, and most of you have seen that that are on this webinar. It stands for meaning, autonomy, growth, impact, and connection. And when those are in place, then that psychological contract is honored. These are things we don't often talk about in the initial part of employment, but these are things that I want to grab out of my employment. So that's part of our, our the topic of our other book, The Magic, Five Keys to Unlock the Power of Employee Engagement. So what we want to do now is um, we'll end this. And Charles, I don't know if you have uh, questions or things you want to talk about specifically or just talk a little bit about the book here. Yeah, so the, the one question I've gotten so far is, can I get a copy of the slides? I'll provide, um, I'll provide some of those resources after the webinar here, um, uh, and I'll email that to you. I have everyone's uh, email within the system. But if you have additional questions, please let us know. The, the one thing you'll see on the slides here are the codes for both HRCI and SHRM recertification credit. So go ahead and write those down. I'll also send them to you in an email so you can capture those and, uh, and use those as well for in the future. Um, but I want to thank everyone for uh, participating, for attending. If you don't have a copy of the employee experience yet, you can uh, get one at Amazon or any of the other uh, retailers that are out there. Um, and thanks, Tracy and Matt, for your presentation it's today. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And we hope to have you join us on a future webinar.